Okay, colleagues, so uh, we start the second part of the, of the research summit. And the second part, the way I sort of imagine, is that we spend the morning talking about the creativity in our classroom, in our own understanding. And now the point is, well, now the point is to apply it a bit, right? So what we have now here will be second, um, second panel. This panel will be about creativity, about, well, let me call it theories of creativity, creativity in general, kind of to summarize what we learn. However, what is equally important is that uh, after this panel, we have three important workshops, not workshops, collaboratives. Why are they important? They are important because, and let me just come back to this theme of the grant, that when we were coming with this idea to NSF, they indicated those three are the most important issues of creativity that we are interested, okay? And what were the three? The three are, first they mentioned this uh, attempt to, b to create the bridge between creativity in our classes and creativity needed in the in uh, in industry, okay? That is the theme of the collaborative six. Then the second was the question of underrepresentation of women. And this is a very sort of, well, it's in some way, it is for me a painful question simply because where I come from, I come from Poland, from the 60s, there was no the case. I mean, we were just very, 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 you know, there were women and men in the physics and mathematics and no one had any problems with that. So this is important. This is important to, to deal with it. And I think that in my eyes, this is one of the solvable problems. This is not unsolvable problem, the underrepresentation of women. So I would like people to really think about it from that perspective. Of course, a lot we talk about it, but the question is, well, what is the past? What is the past that we can really eliminate this, uh, which I find nonsensical uh, comparison, right? And the third part is, well, how do we actually facilitate creativity in the classroom? This is the collaborative, collaborative five, right? Collab uh, the collaborative discussion about women is collaborative four, and um, five is the uh, facilitation of creativity in aha moments in the classroom, and the six is precisely uh, the question of how to find a a smooth pathway between our STEM classroom and the uh, industry. So I would like to invite first here the, uh, the panelist, um, Dr. K. Kim, right? And uh, come on, come on. <laughs> and the person, a colleague who will be mentoring it, right? Nadia Stojanova Kennedy and myself. So this is like a, well, panel two. And after panel two, we have a coffee, and then I would like really get into this important discussions on those three problems. I'm very pleased today to meet you all, but at this very moment to present two presenters, to uh, introduce to you two presenters. The first one is, um, K.H. Kim, she comes, she's a professor of educational psychology at the university, at the College of William and Mary, and um, she has written an article, The Creativity Crisis in America in 2010, published in Newsweek, after which she said that she had to hide for about three months <laughs> from <laughs> journalists. And as a response to this article, um, she has published a book in 2016 titled The Creativity Challenge, How We Can Recapture American Innovation. In addition, she was telling me earlier that she has a so-called CQ test, similar to analogous to IQ, but this is for measuring creativity. It's an online test that use eye tracking camera, um, and maybe she can tell you more about this. 
So she has a um, presentation that um, she will be um, doing in a while. The second presenter is um, Dr. Bronislav Chernocha, who is Chernocha, sorry, who is also um, the one of the organizers of this conference. So he is also a host here. He has been working on creativity with his colleagues for a while, as, as far as I know. Um, he has published with a group of um, other contributors in 2016, right, a book called Creative, The Creative Enterprise of Mathematics Teaching Research. Um, and he has an idea which is still in, in, in the incubation stage to, um, about creating a um, um, teaching research institute which, is, uh, which will be a CUNY-wide institute. So hopefully um, colleagues, me including, will, will help him to realize this idea. Okay. So. <laughs> The floor is yours. Sorry. The article uh, it was published on uh, Newsweek uh, in 2010 was the creative crisis in America. So I discovered, um, based on the Torrance test of uh, creative thinking skills using like uh, almost 300,000 people um, in America since uh, 1958 up to 2008. So I found that on American, uh, American creativity has been decreasing since declining uh, since the uh, 1990s. So that was uh, the article. And then, so after that, um, as a solution, I finished the book. That is uh, like the 2016. Okay. So then we have to talk about what is creativity and what is innovation. So um, can you put it here? So how many of you? Notice the wrong mismatch of these shoes. <laughs> you notice that? But why didn't you tell me? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, it was my mistake, but um, I make mistakes like all the time. But actually, so this is actually you thought I did intentionally, right? So which is unique. People don't do that, so I did it. It's unique. Well, is it useful? Actually, it's useful to me right now because I can explain unique and useful, the concept of unique, unique and useful, right? So, but it is useful to me, only for me. It's one person. Well, it's, uh, um, if uh, the uniqueness is uh, uh, useful to a lot of people, it becomes uh, what? Big C. I call it big I, the big innovation. So earlier, somebody talked about Small C and big C, right? Small creativity, big creativity. But I call it small innovation, big innovation. So, so creativity is uh, the process of making something unique and useful. So creativity is like, uh, look at this seeds, uh, uh, some idea, right? Ideas. And then uh, after we make unique and useful, it becomes innovation. It becomes like small innovation, like uh, arranging uh, to big innovation. So big innovation is uh, useful to a lot of people, like a Nobel Prize winning. Like that. So I have to do it again. Uh, yes, that is. Uh, so the end result, the successful result is uh, innovation. Okay, how? So creative thinking skills, I call it ion thinking skills. So I, uh, as uh, earlier I talked about it, um, the basis of a creative thinking is inbox expertise. So you don't have to be good at a lot of things. You are good at just one thing specifically, inbox, narrow inbox. And then uh, to build expertise, you learn a lot knowledge and you understand the comprehension. And also you have to apl apply what you have learned into real world situation. Right? Okay, so building inbox expertise. So based on my like almost 30 years of uh, uh, research uh, on creativity and the innovators, I found that they started all like this: curiosity by playful introduction. Somebody introduced a specific topic really in a 
playful way, fun, fun way. And then, and then after that, interest by example and application, you show a lot of examples in real world applications, hands-on activities like that. And then after that, big inspiration by something. Oh, like, or by somebody, like role models. Anyway, I'm not, I can't pronounce L, R. I can't differentiate between L, R. So if you can't understand this, you should think about, oh, it's R or L switch. Like election, erection, R, L. Right? So, mm, so, and then after that, so you are really inspired by something, someone, and then you are hooked by it. Then it's a self-exploration. It means you read, you research, right? so you get a lot of more knowledge. And then, so self-efficacy is different from self-confidence. Self-confidence is, a, I'm smart, I'm good, I'm handsome, I'm pretty. But self-efficacy is more specific. What well, I'm good at, what? I'm good at something. I'm good at creativity. I know a lot about something very specific, right? So in the, after you read a lot about the topic and then you know a lot about it, so you become self-confident about a specific topic. And then, so once you are good at it, you, you know a lot, then you become, that is a passion. A lot of people say, right, you have to find your passion, but you don't find your passion. You find interest, but you develop into your passion, right? So once, you, once it becomes your passion, you become persistent because of your passion. So that's how you become expert. Okay, Steve Jobs, uh, it's a Steve Jobs, I analyzed Steve Jobs uh, in my book too, but uh, at first, uh, when he was six and seven years old, one of his neighbors, Larry, Rang, Larry Lang, gave him a carbon microphone that oh, did not have a, any amplifier, but it made some sound. So, like, somehow the way he showed to Steve Jobs was really interesting, fun, right? And then, so, and then he, he got curious about it. And then, later, he also gave him, like, ham radio circuit board kits. And then, so he was, um, took it apart, a lot of things, and then, together? assembled together, what do you say, put it together. So he did a lot of uh, things, uh, radio or a TV, uh, like uh, a lot of things uh, in, in real life, right? And then he made that too. And then after that, oh, when, he, when he visited the HP Hewlett Pack company, uh, he was uh, one of the uh, student member for HP Explorer Club. So that's for high school students. When he was in high school, oh, no, 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 earlier. Nine years old, he visited the HP, and then he saw the first computer, desktop computer in the world. And then he was really like shocked or really inspired, hooked. Okay, since then, he did uh, a lot of like reading and research in the Humboldt Computer Club. He joined, and then finally, he met Steve Wozniak, and then they made this blue box, illegal blue box, illegal. Uh, to hack uh, AT&T long distance call company. So it means you can make a phone calls free. free without calling. So then he, they made the blue box, they sold it. After that, they become like, wow, we can do this. We can make electronics and we can sell, we can make money. So that's how their partnership started based on their, what they have done. And then it becomes their passion and then they, of course, in the persistent, and they, that's how they uh, become expert on that. And then Albert Einstein, six years old, when he was six years old, his father gave him a compass with a really fun story. And then he got really curious. And then violin, his mom taught violin, right? And then it's a fun way. And then uh, after that, his uncle Jacob was an inventor. He uh, patented a lot of products, mm, what is it, like uh, circuit breakers, meters, and a lot of electronics he invented, and then he actually showed, so it means real life examples, uh, he, he, he saw that. And then, so uh, his uncle's dream was to change the entire Munich 
city is uh, gaslighted into uh, electronic light, light bulb. And then at the same time, he got this Talmi, uh, Talmi, Max Talmi. It was a, a medical, 20 years old medical student who visited uh, Einstein's house every Thursday for five years, from 10 years old to what is it, 15 years old. So he really, he was a role model and also he was mentoring. And every week he gave uh, him a lot of like, uh, science books and then uh, a week later they discussed a lot. So at, after that, so he read a lot and then also uh, Einstein did a lot of thought experiments all, also alone. And then he was a confident in the passion, so like that, okay. So then, uh, if, you, uh, become, if you become expert, you know a lot about one topic, right? And then without uh, outbox thinking, outbox imagination, you become boring and bored technician, right? So, and also if you know too much, that limits uh, your imagination also, then, oh, it doesn't work. We have been doing that forever, right? We can change that like that. So, so uh, while we are um, um, developing this expertise, we also have to focus on this uh, outbox imagination also. But so, so many people think uh, this outbox imagination or out of the box thinking or diversion thinking as uh, creative thinking. Most people think like that, but no. It's just a part of a creative thinking, a part of a creative thinking, but important. So just like uh, um, okay, I used to grow, my, my parents uh, grow apple trees, so I know about apple a lot. So um, uh, when it's uh, outbox imagination, outbox thinking consists of uh, fluency, flexibility, originality. And then, so you think about what if, what if, like uh, something not possible, what if, right? You imagine a lot. And then I can't, really, I can't just talk. So it's like blooming. So it means when you want to get a new, uh, new so it means uh, our box imagination, asking new, new question and then trying to find the unique answers. So you find the new problem and then finding new answers, right? And then, so you need to uh, generate a lot of ideas. So that's why I compare to this blooming, blooming, a lot of blooming, like uh, uh, spontaneously, like blooming a lot of flowers. So you get ideas without thinking, without judgment, you uh, try to generate a lot of ideas. Okay, and then after that, after you got a lot of ideas, right? sometimes aha moment happens also when you generate a lot of ideas and then you, because you are thinking about it a lot and then you take a break and then sometimes your subconscious is still working for you and then that's how your aha moment happens. But after aha moment, you have to verify whether it works or not. So that is a critical thinking. So it is also based on inbox expertise also. So it means uh, all outbox imagination, all creative thinking is based on your inbox expertise. At least how many years, 10 years. So it's a, you have to have one, like, so it means you have to have an expert in one specific area before you have an outbox imagination. So in the inbox critical thinking, I look at it as a, like a pr pruning. There are a lot of like, uh, uh, blooms, right? If uh, you leave all those blooms, then what happens? You have too many apples. So then, useless. It's a, you can't, really, you have really li small, small apples. It's really not, uh, not good apples at all, so it, you have to trim out. So that's uh, like analysis and evaluation. Um, so, and after that, so you make it useful. So using outbox imagination, you make the idea really unique, unique ideas you generate. And then after that, using inbox critical thinking, you make the unique ideas really useful. So first, the unique, uniqueness, unique ideas by Outbox imagination and then useful ideas based on um, after inbox critical thinking. So and then the last stage is a new box connection. So it is uh, um, you connecting. So a lot of people say connecting dots. Creativity is connecting dots or connecting totally unrelated things together or connecting two different area, math and science together, or science and the music together, like Einstein. So uh, it's a connection, and then so there is a synthesis. 
you synthesize like a, a, the unique and useful elements of uh, before the stage, right? Before you got this uh, unique and useful elements, and then you synthesize, and then you refine it. That how uh, it, uh, innovation happens. Okay, I talked about earlier gifted education. So I told you uh, choosing students with the IQ and the test scores, right? So then most uh, disadvantaged students uh, are missed. And uh, um, also conforming behaviors, the teacher pleasers are identified as gifted. So ignoring students disadvantaged, non-conformist risk takers, and outbox thinkers, and students who are strongly interested in a topic. So they are not in gifted program. Okay, so test I call it test central education. So uh, my article, Creative Crisis, I just updated the Creative Crisis uh, data um, using 2017 data, so it is under review right now. But, so I found that the Creative Crisis is going even worse, even worse, because of uh, this test-centric education. Because uh, teachers are focused on who? Because original, no child left behind, uh, uh, the original intention was what? To close gap between poor, the poor and the rich. However, uh, if a student's passing rate, uh, uh, based on student's passing rate, uh, uh, teachers lose a job, right? Or they get a uh, bonus like that. So only they, these teachers are focused on who? The passing score, right? Cut line, cut off score. So the students who are right below the cutoff score. So and then uh, teachers uh, ignore students who are up here, students way down there. So in that, so it's, it's a gap is even bigger, bigger. And then at the same time, because we are focused on um, test scores, actually test scores are strengths of uh, what Asian Asian country students. If you look at international test scores, who are the top or the Asian students, right? That's their strengths, but America's strength is what? Creativity and innovation. So it means uh, this uh, no child left behind is uh, well, focusing on weakness, America's weakness. Because they are focused on American weakness, which is a test score, and then they lose their strengths, creativity, they lose creativity. So, and then, so, okay, gifted program or, or test training education, uh, they are really focused on, because a lot of tests, uh, in order to get better scores on test, test, you have to focus on knowledge and comprehension, right? You have to memorize a lot. So, but you don't have opportunities, uh, application. So that's why it's hard to develop an expertise in, in a topic. And then, of course, no outbox imagination, no time. All the teachers, whenever I have this speak, a speak engagement, the teachers say, Dr. Kim, we don't have time for creativity. There's no time, right? So no, no outbox imagination or no new box connections. Okay. So then, I am thinking, oh, then, this creative thinking is how we can foster this creative thinking. Then, it is from the attitude of people, the personality, the attitude. So I call it 4S attitude. So, Okay, there are four attitudes. So the first attitude, son attitude. Um, so these attitudes uh, encourage outbox uh, imagination, or optimistic, and then big picture thinking, curious, playful, spontaneous, energetic, right? So you can't be serious, you have to be playful, right? So those that uh, 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 helps with the outbox uh, imagination. And the inbox expertise from storm attitude, independent, self-disciplined. So I got this, uh, all these attitudes based on the meta-analysis of all existing uh, creativity research since 1965. And then I summarized like this. So independent and self-disciplined and diligent, I told you earlier, self-efficacy. It's not self-confident. Self-confident does not uh, predict your achievement or success. Self-efficacy does. So risk-taking and the persistent. So, uh, okay. And then critical thinking from soil attitude, open-minded. Um, so you delay your judgment. 
so you, that's open minded because I have to explain because if I ask you, are you open minded? Then 100% people say, I am open minded, but it's not like that though. Oh, <laughs> uh, by cultural, so even you don't have to live in another country, but in your home home you can have a two culture, right? My my dad is from here, from there, like a totally different culture, and then mentored. So always there was a, at least one mentor. The successful innovators, at least one mentor. Like uh, all those Nobel Prize winners, I, I looked into Nobel Prize winners in science. All of them had at least, uh, at least one mentor who was a previous Nobel Prize winner. So they got this shortcut, right? <laughs> so, and then uh, complex thinking. So it means that you can't, so okay, instead of thinking black and white, Right or wrong, a lot of, the, the, I think it's a Disney movie. If you look at Snow White, Cinderella, there are always uh, good people, bad people, right? So that's not good. It's a, it's a complex thinking means uh, like a more like a gray thinking, not black or, wh black or white or good or bad. It's always, uh, you know, people can be bad or, and good, right, sometimes, uh, depending on the situation, right? And then resourceful is uh, really important, right? Okay, and then the last one is uh, emotional. No, in this culture, like especially men are not to be emotional. I don't know, but in Asian culture, like that. But uh, so, but like uh, innovators are more emotional. And then compassionate, like, uh, empathetic, and compassionate, self-reflective. You think so? You need a long time. This is all about a long time. Self-reflective, autonomous. Autonomous is more like. Uh, Intrinsic motivation I'm talking about, like uh, you do something because uh, you like it. And then daydreaming, fantasizing, daydreaming, and then non-conforming. Earlier I talked about non-conforming, right? Gender bias free and the defiant, okay? So, and then the last one is this uh, forest climate. So then how do we get this forest attitude? How can we get creative attitude? That's from climates, cultures, societies, Parenting, schooling, like that. So, forest climates. So, uh, so I call it cats. Why it's cats? Because climate attitude thinking skills. So, the first one is outbox imagination for inspiring, encouraging some climate, right? So, encourage curiosity. I did earlier, right? Encourage curiosity, interest in STEM. So, what you can, you know, you can give a lot of playful introduction, like uh, to a topic, to topics. And uh, you, re you give a real-world examples, right? And uh, 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 what is it? applications. And then also inspire big dreams. Big dreams. Like uh, even the unrealistic, right? Like uh, earlier, you need to have like big dreams. Okay. And then second one is uh, storm climate, high expectation holding challenging. So earlier, we talked about build expertise in STEM, in STEM one area, not not trying to be good at a lot of things on one area. And then daily effort is really important that you work on it every day, even though it's a 10 minutes, 20 minutes, work on it every day. It way, uh, and also another thing is um, like writers, right? Like you want to be perfect writing. Like, uh, and then you, you are like improving the, what you wrote again, 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 then it doesn't work. So you just produce, 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 which means that we have to focus on quantity more than quality. And then as you have more quantity, 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 quality improves also. So it's a, innovators in history, they produce more, than, way more than other people. It's a Steve Jobs, so he produces way more than other, other people. And then one of them becomes what? Recognized as, as an innovation. So it means the quantity is really important. And then another thing is a failure, the honest feedback. Okay. In uh, Asian countries, uh, it's uh, easy to give a feedback to students. Okay, you are not good at this, so you have to do this, this, right? They appreciate. And in this, I'm a professor in College of William Mary, and then if I give feedback, they cry. Even their doctoral students, they cry and cry. We n I never got feedback like this. It's a brutally honest feedback. So innovators, uh, successful innovators uh, seek brutally honest feedback. The earlier they are, like from the, from the beginning, they are good at, like they have to experience, they have to practice to get like a, a accurate, accurate feedback. And, uh, and also they learn it's okay to fail early. 
Okay, and then uh, first the complex thinking I did earlier, like uh, not uh, black and white thinking, and the cross pollinate. So, it's a cross pollination is uh, really important. It's more than collaboration. Collaboration is you have uh, the same goal, G O A L, and then you work together. But cross pollination happens in, informally also. Like in Silicon, Silicon Valley, it happens a lot. So, after they finish work and they go for drink, beer, then they happen to talk about what they did today, and they all of a sudden, oh, that's interesting. So I, so they connect each other, like uh, my idea, your idea, even the totally they are doing totally different uh, work. And then so, so cross pollinate instead of uh, focusing on your weakness, you own, you uh, you have to focus on just one thing, and then you work with others who have, uh, who can compensate your weakness, right? So 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 you work with uh, other strengths. So a lot of people think. Um, like uh, Einstein did alone. So it means Einstein is a genius. But that's not true. Without his friends, he couldn't have done anything. Or without first uh, girlfriend, the first wife, he couldn't have done anything. So either you should work with your girlfriend or wife, or you have to have somebody who can, like, uh, who can maximize your strengths and uh, like, compensate your weakness, right? And then also, most innovators work with non-peers. I don't know why but it's non-peers. I, I can't say I don't know because it's a, it gives a different perspective. It's not peers, right? So they, had, they worked with non-peers and they had mentors. And then also, okay, we focus on STEM, STEM, STEM today, but if we are focused on STEM, 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 or in math, 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 that doesn't work. You are in math, then you need to work with somebody who is not in math and science like that, so you connect it. So creativity is just a new box connections, right? So totally unrelated things, areas you need to connect. So you have to work with somebody who is in another area. Or like if it's, and then also, like not just inside the STEM, outside of STEM also, because uh, like Steve Jobs, is, uh, like, uh, he connected between technology and what? People say art, right? Aesthetics, art. Okay, and then outbox imagination, the last outbox imagination, deep and free thinking. So it means you need alone time, alone. So nowadays, the children are really stimulated, stimulated. They have a lot of activities, right? So they don't have alone time, and there is no creativity. So, and then also foster non conformity. You have to act different. So, like this different mismatching shoes, right? There are many other ways. And uh, challenge, the, so that's the most important, challenge the status quo in STEM. The, you can challenge the theory, like all those uh, rules, law, law, right? You see, I have problem with RL. So, um, that, so we need to do that. And then, this is the last one. <clears throat> okay, what is IQ? IQ. What is your IQ? What is your IQ? No, I, I asked, why did your IQ? It means like uh, 100 or 120, you don't know. <laughs> yeah, I know. So in the future, we will ask uh, what is your CQ, not IQ. Because uh, in the future, you know, there are a lot of future problems, right? Future problems are uh, solved by Existing answers? No, there is. There, we have to have new answers, new unique answers, right? So then, it's important to measure your creativity, creativity quotient. Creativity quotient is CQ, and then we are measuring climate attitude thinking skills. All of this, uh, using you have you ever heard about Torrance test? Torrance test. Okay. So Dr. Torrance uh, passed away, but he's the father of creativity in the world, he's well known. So he is, his uh, test is a Torrance test of creative thinking skills, uh, worldwide famous. And he, it has been uh, translated into 40 different countries. But the problem is, uh, it, it was developed in 19, oh, 1958. It's too old and it's only paper pencil test. So I made it it's with a computer programmer. So I said earlier, uh, two uh, biotechnology patterns, right? So one of these is online eye tracking camera. 
So using online eye tracking camera, so I can tell you a inbox thinker, outbox thinker, critical thinker, like that. So you can contact me later. So I will, I will test your CQ. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And now I'm going to ask Professor Charnot Shah, what is, what is creativity? I titled my part of this uh, panel, Creativity of the Gifted and the Creativity of the Rank and File. I like this phrase, Rank and File, because it conveys certain, I don't know how to say it, uh, something very uh, down to ground, uh, life, walking in life one after another. It is a file. It's an old expression, but it really uh, talks about people who are normal. Normal people. Okay. Uh, what I want to connect to what Dr. Kim was saying, first I have to establish that there is some similarity, but not much. In fact, in many respects, we differ very much on, on the very basic questions. However, I found in, 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 in case paper a very interesting statement about, precisely in this paper she wrote about lowering creativity in the states, right? There's a very important paper in which uh, she was able to show that indeed starting from 1990, creativity was slowly falling down till 2008, 2010. And that's serious. Right, so talking about those students who are uh, falling out, who are going through the cracks, she says, such students may only be aware of their potential for creative productivity and the intrinsic rewards derived from the act of creating once they were placed in an environment that encourages creativity. Right, so she's pointing out that all those people that sort of follow out from the, from the, from the creative tests, all those people that are coming out of, uh, drop out of schools, they are creative. They are creative, but they don't get in touch with their own creativity. And what is interesting for me is that it is exactly similar conclusion that one of our colleagues reached at early stages of our work. She was writing, Dr. Prab, who, who was in our uh, teaching research team of the Bronx, she discovered that creativity in teaching remedial mathematics is teaching gifted students how to access their own giftedness. So in other words, the discussions that we often have in our classroom about our classroom switches a bit from the requirement or from the, um, you know, from the cognitive aspects. The problem is not in cognition, she used to say to us. The problem is in motivation. The problem is that the students just don't want to. Not that they are stupid, not that they cannot, they simply don't want to. And the idea that she had was, well, the only way to, 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 change, uh, to, to change the situation is through creativity, because creativity seems to have extremely strong motivation part. Okay, and that is where is the common aspects between what uh, Jay is talking, Kay is talking, and me. Uh, because in many respects, uh, I am going slightly different way. And I wanna say that our efforts turn towards the creativity precisely to answer the question, how to do it, how to facilitate our student awareness of their own creative potential. How to facilitate, how, how to make them aware of it, right? And that's where the creativity of aha moment came, right? Because aha moment is, is, is noticeable, right? Aha moment comes with extremely strong positive emotion. Right? And aha moment can bring the student out of the slum into a, a very, 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 how should I say, uh, high level of understanding within a second. Right? Within a second of the moment of insight. Yeah, and they are quite common in our classes, belong to the experience of anyone, more or less. And we are emphasizing commonality of aha moments precisely because that gives us a tool not only for people who are creative, but for all people. Because aha moments is experienced by everyone. I essentially, whenever I am coming to my classroom and I ask about aha moment, the hands, after they understand what I'm talking about, the hands rise, of course, 
We know it, right? We know this moment when suddenly everything becomes clear uh, uh, and, and, and we are happy, right? So, uh, where is the problem? It's, uh, the problem is that when people are talking about giftedness at, at present, right, uh, the giftedness is measured by, um, you know, SAT results and by IQ and all those things, right, which, which, uh, which seems to eliminate our students, right? Well, how come? Well, because they are not in touch with their own creativity. It has nothing to do with the, uh, with the how do you call it, the intelligence test and those. That seems to me irrelevant. What is relevant is to be in touch with it. And once we are in touch, we just fly. There is no problem, seems to me. Okay. So, in other words, what we are talking about, we are talking about finding what is called creativity of all. Creativity that every person independently whether the term gifted or not gifted can participate and do it and 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 be happy with it right so that's why our our sort of our attention went to the work of arthur kessler um, there is a rather old work called the act of creation from 1964 in which he is very clearly specifies what is this aha moment which he calls by association by association is a spontaneous leap of insight which connects previously unconnected frames of reference and he also tells us that he has coined the term by association in order to make the distinction between the routine skills of thinking on a single plane as it were, and the creative act, which always operates on more than one plane. So, in other words, creative act has a dual nature, has a, cognitive, has, a, has a cognitive nature by sudden leap of understanding and has the affective nature by elimination of routine habits of thinking and feeling about mathematics and feeling good about mathematics of science. Uh, I am referring to the distinction between routine skill of thinking and creativity that appears in contemporary research very strongly in engineering, in mathematics, and it leads Kessler to the analysis of the relationship between, uh, between the um, affect and, crea and creativity. And what he says is that the creative act is the act of liberation, the defeat of habit by originality. So in other words, he sees, and all of us also see it, that the aha moment has incredibly strong um, power to, to, well, to break, in our cases, what we need is negative thinking of students about mathematics, and it happens. So on my part, sort of like very important idea is, well, what could be something they call aha pedagogy? What does it mean, aha pedagogy? Well, aha pedagogy is a pedagogy that is based, that is geared, towards the facilitation of aha moment, and in such a way that at the same time in the class we can take advantage of one or two and push the discussion much farther because it's already introduced. The fact that uh, cognitive act has such a dual nature of cognition, pardon, that uh, by social, uh, creative act has a dual nature, it was noticed before, in fact there is very important a colleague of ours, Peter Liliedal, and his whole dissertation was actually spent on showing that indeed a how moment is accompanied first and foremost by a positive affect. I differ with him about that a bit because he seems to see that there is only positive affect. He doesn't see any mathematical changes, great changes. Of course, there are, right? Because uh, what aha moment does, and I will come to a definition again for a minute, what it does, it connects. It connects separate components, right? So in other words, uh, once it connects, it builds a larger schema of thinking, which is a very mathematically important fact, right? How do we develop concepts, right? They grow, right, and they make the connection, right? And ultimately, the, the easiness of thinking is the easiness uh, to move along the network of concepts, right? Conceptual network within the schema. So, uh, what exactly... Uh, let me not lose myself, right? So, uh, 
what is important for me also to say is that the power of student discovery brought by the insight of the Eureka moment can bring student understanding to much higher conceptual level, which I will hope to discuss in Collaborative 5 soon. So the question comes, is it really creativity? Don't we overuse the term that should in reality be applied to the novel creativity of mature mathematicians, scientists, and so on. And this relates to what uh, Jerry Goldin was talking about, big C creativity and small C creativity, right? And uh, the question is, to what degree one can consider new student understanding of standard mathematical facts brought forth by the moment of this life as a creativity? And this is very much debated, and that's why this idea of capital C and small c came about, because people started noticing that it is not the question of a you know, genius, but it is the question simply of creativity of every one of us, right? Namely, in such a way that even if, even if, the new idea that the student or learner is getting is not new to the social environment. It is as long as it is new to him or her, that's creativity. So maybe let's establish that, right? That there is a, both uh, objective creativity, as people talk, and subjective creativity, that is the creativity of the, of the person itself independently of what impact does it make on the society and so on. And I think that in our classes it's extremely important to emphasize that creativity, right? Because it's not the issue whether you will get a Nobel Prize, as Kim likes to say, but it is the issue of that moment, of that process, of that experience. And my hope is that by accumulating that experience, one can really develop a way of thinking for students and ours, which goes very very far. Uh, let me just say that, again, it is not so much, uh, it is being recognized, but not by too many people, right? Among mathematicians who were able to observe their own thinking, we don't have many names. We have Poincaré, we have uh, Einstein, and we have Adamart. Adamart, French mathematician, who told us that between the work of the student that tries to solve a problem in geometry or algebra, and the work of invention, of a mathematician, one can say there is only the difference in degree. There is no difference in the nature of the process. And that means that what our students experience in our classroom when we can facilitate this moment, they experience exactly the same what Einstein experienced when he was thinking, for example, about sitting on the on the, on the electromagnetic wave, we're moving with it with a constant, with that light velocity, and then he says, I am just moving up and down. I am not moving forward, just up and down, right? And that was this big aha moment for him that led him to the whole general relativity and so on. Uh, just returning for a minute, and I will be finishing, I would like to return for a minute to the Kessler definition because its formulation gives us a hint where and how to facilitate student creativity. He says again, by association is a spontaneous leap of insight which connects previously unconnected frames of reference. We see that the gap in understanding, the absence of the connection is necessary for that moment. So in other words, we should look creativity for where people don't understand something, not when they do, right? So in other words, what I want to say is that such a gap is often created by student misconception, right? So there is a, a, a very concrete uh, a, a gap between the mathematical reality and student misconception about that, right? And it is precisely in the eliminating those misconceptions of students that aha moments turns out to be extremely, extremely useful. Why? Precisely because, because of the absence of understanding, but this absence of understanding is not too big. I mean, it depends on how big is the gap, right? And the whole goal of a teacher in the classroom is to lead students, to scaffold student understanding in such a way that at some point there is enough space for the student to make his own qualitative jump of the insight, right? But we can do it. We can ask questions, we can listen to what students answer, we can ask another question, and in fact, it is in this process of 
of, of interaction with the student, what sometimes happens, it happens that one can have aha moment together, student and mentor. It's very interesting what we observed once, right? It's, well, I, we described it, but it's very important that, and it comes more and more often in our panel, number one, people were talking about the intimacy of the experience. People were talking about that it comes when I am interacting with the student. And this act of interaction is precisely the creation of what we call bisociative system, which allows for such things to, uh, to occur. Just one more sentence, because it's important. I want to say that, in fact, it is thanks to work of Professor Baker that we were able, we were able to make the connection between creativity and theories of learning, the theory of learning, and that gives us, gives us a tool how to assess the depth of understanding reached by a person during the inside of her moment. If we make connection with what is known about schema development of thinking, we can quite precisely say, aha, that was as, as big as that. Aha, it was as big as that. So there are ways of measuring creativity, which is totally non, uh, it's called non, non in, in invasive, non invasive. That is to say, we don't do anything to the student or, 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 or tie his, uh, his or her uh, um, thinking to the habit. No, we measure understanding itself. And I would like to finish. That gives us a tool, very important tool for the classroom. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. So we heard um, some rather long definitions <laughs> on creativity <laughs> from our two uh, presenters. And uh, now I'd like to ask a few questions, each one of them, and uh, would like to have your short answers so that we can open the discussion um, to our audience and have questions from them as well. So my first question is about the difference between creative thinking and what I would label now ordinary thinking and learning. Piaget says to understand is to invent. So what's the difference between creative thinking and the thinking that we are engaged every, every day and virtually every minute when we are trying to understand something or we are grappling with something? When Could you speak to we that? are trying to understand something, we use uh, on the early stage of knowledge, right? knowledge and uh, uh, comprehension. So it means that we use uh, inbox thinking, inbox thinking skill of inbox thinking skill of creative thinking, and then we when we are trying to solve some problem, then we are using outbox imagination of creative thinking skills. So even we, in, in daily life, we have a lot of problems we have to solve every day. So we use a lot of um, outbox thinking imagination though. So even though it's not, it doesn't reach, right, reach to big innovation, big eye, but there will be a lot of uh, small eye, small innovation in daily life. So you're saying that uh, mm -hmm. We do have, like our, mm -hmm. if I call it ordinary thinking, mm -hmm. has different yes. components yes. of critical thinking, but this yes. is not like a, the full package. You go home tonight and then you want, you're hungry, you want to cook something, and then you don't follow recipe. You just use whatever you have in your refrigerator. You make something new, and then it's a really, uh, you say your fam or family members say it's really good and it's useful to three people, four people, right? So it's a, a unique because there is no recipe. You made the out of a recipe it's unique and useful. So it's all it's a small innovation, small I. Okay, thank you. I agree to a large degree. I would phrase it in a different way in, in, in the language that I am thinking about is um, routine thinking and creative thinking. And that comes in literature very, very often, right? When we, uh, what, what, what Kay was talking, to follow the um, uh, prescription how to cook, right? There is, it's a routine thinking. You read, you understand, and you do, 
right? On the other hand, when you take all those things from the refrigerator and do something uh, different, you don't follow a recipe. You do something else. So in a very simple way, I would say that uh, the difference is um, one is more automatic, one is more uh, prescribed, like, uh, what's his name, uh, Kessler says, along one plane. The other one is at least two planes, at least uh, something new. When, when, when the person cooks, right, doesn't have the pre uh, recipe, with it, so takes this, takes this, tries it, right, cooks as something more and so on. And all of this together, right, all of this together clearly says there is no any prescription. It comes on a moment. So that's how I would uh, talk about the difference. The routine versus well, creative, right? Non-routine. Okay, so routine well, thinking normally uses inbox thinking. And then, so yeah, when you want to solve a new problem or new, something making, or to try to make something new, you use outbox imagination. Okay, thanks. Um, maybe we'll hear more from the audience a little bit later. I'm moving to the, to the next question. Yeah, you had a question? Yeah, well, yeah. I have a few more questions yeah, right. to our panelists and then we can ask the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, um, is there a place for hard work and effort in creativity or does creativity ex exclusively rely on sudden insights? I think right. both of you spoke yeah, yeah. a little bit about that, but if you can elaborate. So there is no, like, no sudden insight out of blue. It means it has to be based on at least 10 years of uh, inbox expertise for big innovation. So there must be a lot of effort, hard, hard work to become an expert. And so both, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, so on this aspect I differ. I differ very strongly from Kay. Uh, how do I differ? You see, I don't think 10 years, never. <laughs> I would never go into, uh, into any profession that I know that it would take 10 years to become an expert. And also, I am not sure whether expertise is really necessary for creativity. I am not sure at all, and I have doubts about it, because we know the more expertise we have, the less freedom from the, for, the, for the unexpected, right? To have expertise. It means to follow certain procedures, certain prescriptions, right? But isn't it creativity in contradiction with following certain prescription? Yes, so, so that's why uh, <laughs> so that's inbox uh, expertise, right? So if you just use inbox expertise, inbox thinking, you become a boring and bored technician. And then, but also if you only use outbox imagination, you become frustrated. Dreamers, right. right, I agree, I agree. <laughs> but that means, you see, what, what was passing also during our discussion before, namely that essential role, it seems to me, and that's why I put it even into the title of the collaborative six, the essential role is precisely to find what is the right balance between what you call outbox and inbox, what I call creative and routine thinking. And I would say strongly from engineering, it comes, what is the balance between creative problem solving and routine problem solving in our, in our classes? Okay, I hear a tension here between these two poles. Um, not, not, not the poles, poles. of our pan panelists, but uh, the poles that they identified as expertise and imagination. So maybe we can... Um, talk a little bit um, but about it that. It is not my on. opinion. It's based on research results. It's not my own op opinion. Okay. My next question is about um, um, the differentiation that some um, people make between creativity of professional scientists and mathematicians and engineers and um, students. Yeah, um, Creativity at school level, yes. are there differences? Mm -hmm. And what, so, what are they? So after like outbox thinking, out, outbox imagination, we need a critical thinking, right? However, uh, critical thinking requires abstract thinking also. So, but abstract thinking forms uh, uh, teenagers, your uh, like, so teenager period. So before that, 
you don't really have uh, uh, enough uh, abstract, thi abstract thinking skills and uh, critical or logical thinking skills. So that's the difference between a uh, professional you know, mathematician, they have the ability, but before that, uh, children don't have that. So, but still, they can practice on this, um, like, uh, uh, what is it, curiosity and interest in specific topic, and the outbox thinking ability, outbox thinking skills, outbox imagination skills they can practice, even though they don't have this uh, really uh, good uh, critical thinking skills yet. Developed. Yeah, developed, developed yet, yeah. Repeat your question, yes, sir, uh, once more. What's your question? difference between the creative process of experts, mathematicians, scientists, engineers, and creative process of creative thinking of students in the classroom? Yeah. Is there a difference? Yeah. So, uh, uh, yes. So I just want to read again this quote from the Adamar with whom I fully exist. He says that between the work of students who try to solve a problem in geometry or algebra in the classroom, hmm? And the work of invasion, of invention of a mathematician or scientist. He says, one can say there is only the difference of degree, the difference of a level, but the both works are of a similar nature. So this is very important, right? Because what it tells us, it tells us that the deep nature of the creativity between accomplished scientist and beginning student is exactly the same. What differs is the language which they use. What differs is the depth of, uh, of the insight that they reach. But the process creative is exactly the same. And this is, to me, is, is, is very hopeful, in fact. And I very much embrace this point precisely because uh, it joins both aspects, right? On one hand, we have creativity of the nature, similar. And on the other hand, we know that, of course, there is a different levels of knowledge and therefore the depth of insight in each case will be different. But it's an insight nonetheless. Okay. Thank you. Well, however, uh, in terms of outbox imagination, uh, sometimes the children, the children can, be more, uh, can have more outbox uh, imagination also because we are born with uh, this outbox thinking, outbox imagination, however, like, uh, like when you are born, and your parents kill your outbox imagination. Some parents, not all. And then, and then teachers who really follow strict rules, right? Who are really conformist. Like a lot of research shows, that a lot of elementary school teachers are conformist. Mm -hmm. I'm not offending anyone, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's why uh, uh, students, uh, 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 students' uh, outbox imagination skills are killed by parents, teachers, and the, the society. So, and then, once you become adult, some people don't have any outbox imagination at all. I see that. Okay, so would that be, yes, an answer to the question, there may be then differences between, yeah, there are differences. Yes. between mm -hmm. the creative but thinking of professional yes, yes. mathematicians, yes. scientists, right. and... But, but, but if, uh, like, uh, some adults uh, never lost their childlike spirit or never lost their outbox imagination. Right. Then they are, they have, uh, like, they are outbox thinkers. So, and then they have expertise, then they become innovators. Yeah. Okay. Why should we care about creativity what in the classroom? Think? What do you think? <laughs> Why? We want to hear your yeah, answer uh, first. Because, uh, uh, earlier I said, like, we, we will have uh, uh, like a resource like, uh, in the world. There is a, what kind of problems do we have? Um, food, shortage, or, and resources, energy. Right? Energy. Like, there are a lot of like, uh, future problems, right? And then, so for those problems, if we try to solve these problems uh, using existing old methods, old answers, uh, it wouldn't work, right? So in order to save the future, we need uh, this, uh, creative thinking. Okay. Well, I have a, a different sort of metaphor. For me, creative thinking is like flying in air. This is, of course, a certain, um, 
one has to know I'm also a glider pilot, so I know a bit about flying in air. And I must say, the feeling when you are in a glider and you fly in air is very similar to exactly that feeling that you have when you have a aha moment. It's like flying. So, yeah, uh, we can divide into two, like a small innovation, big innovation, right? Maybe you are talking about more small innovation. Means, okay. So in terms of a big innovation, it's a solving future problems. In terms of a small innovation, we can say um, finding, I think the ultimate goal of education should be to find uh, each student's curiosity and interest and then develop into passion and then they uh, reach their maximum potential. They should be the ultimate goal, right? So that is, uh, Ah, it's more, it's more innovation, and it can be big innovation. Thank you. My last question, and then we'll open um, to other questions. Can, can creativity be taught? What does research tell us? Yes, definitely. So, but the uh, first problem is a lot of people, especially in this country, uh, they don't think they are creative. Oh, I'm not creative. Why? Do you know why they, are not, they say they are not creative? Why? Oh, I can't draw. I can't dance like that. But creativity is uh, not just the uh, arts and crafts, right? It's everywhere. in STEM, too. So you need to like, uh, think uh, really differently. So it means that you can develop all this outbox uh, imagination. So it's definitely okay, but from expertise development and then outbox imagination, there are a lot of like skills that we can do. But today I was supposed to talk only for 20 minutes. I couldn't do that, but normally I talk for three days. <laughs> okay. Um, why do we care for creativity? Does it know? No. Can, taught. can it be taught? What does it mean to teach? What does it mean to teach anything? Uh, that's a question. You see, I don't think it can be taught, but I have in my mind teaching. I will uh, teach you today wait, 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 how wait, to wait, be creative. Wait, 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 wait. I have in my mind, uh, well, you know what we do in the classes, like most of the time we tell students, we have classes, lectures, and so on, right? So if, the, if by teaching we mean a standard way of teaching, that is to say, to, sa to tell the students to give the information, this, this, and that, I don't think that uh, that has anything to do with teaching creativity. Can I rephrase the question then? I would rephrase the question then. Can we help students to become creative thinkers? Yeah. So more, you should be more question. like, uh, yes, of creativity we can. can be developed, right? I mean, developed is better than taught. <laughs> right, 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 right. So, uh, yes, definitely we can. I think definitely we can. But what we can do, you see, this is the issue. When we teach in a standard way, it is the transmission, right? Transmission of knowledge. But that will not do. So what, do, what can we do, right? What we can do, we have to create a learning environment by itself within which the student can, can, uh, can, can grasp things can become creative. But to make someone creative, I don't believe so. To facilitate creativity of the person, yes. Okay. Thanks, that's probably I will make you no. creative today. <laughs> to finish with, and let's, let's open to the audience. Your questions, please. Yeah. Okay, so um, I just have one question. Um, before I attended this conference, I heard about critical thinking. And today in the conference, I'm learning creative thinking. So are these kind two thinking are overlapping or just uh, are there some difference? So uh, it is in a, uh, it means a different time, different process. You use it in a different time, different, different, different stages of your problem solving or idea generation or so it means earlier, so it means uh, earlier outbox imagination, after you get a lot of unique ideas, unique solutions, and then you have to verify whether it works or not, their, their ideas are really good or not, useful or not. So then you need critical thinking, right? So it's a little bit separate process, but 
uh, necessary, both the process are necessary for creative thinking, real creative thinking skills. Okay, um, I have two questions, so I want to ask them simultaneously. Uh, Dr. Kim, I really appreciated your presentation, especially of this framework. Um, I noticed that a lot of qualities that were listed in those those S's, the cats, right, mm -hmm. are the kind of things that I would look for in a research student, right? These are the kind of um, qualities that I think are, are things that I would look for. But um, you kind of mentioned how with the IQ test, mm -hmm how they are biased right. towards students of higher social economic course, status, right? Yeah. Have you done any research to see if this framework or even the assessment that you have de developed have been biased toward any groups in particular? And then the second question is sort of related to the question mm -hmm. that um, uh, was asked about uh, why do we care about creativity? And that's kind of, I think about as a scientist, I mean, some of us are answering questions where we can see the application of it and the impacts on the world and mm -hmm. solving world problems. Mm -hmm. But some of us are just curious. And mm -hmm. like, we just want to know the answer to that question because like, we don't know the answer and we want to know. And it's interesting to us. So, so how does creativity play into our answering those kind of questions as well, even if we don't see the application of it immediately? Well, actually, uh, I teach uh, application every day though, the real specific skills. But just uh, because uh, I, don't, I don't talk about it today, but I teach it. So I have, for this, just the last semester, spring semester, I taught uh, um, the new science of creative class. So for entire semester, I taught like how to develop inbox thinking skills, how to develop outbox imagination, new box connection, each one. And also it's how to develop this uh, uh, non-conforming attitude. So, and then that will be that is uh, my second book coming soon. So you can buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> it's very specific, like uh, proceeds or a specific skill, a specific uh, strategy and examples at home and in classroom. Could you repeat your question? <laughs> second one. Second one. Right, 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 right. I mean, because I feel like we all value creativity, but, but why is that? Yes, I think that it is, um, you see, independently of uh, sort of those applications you mentioned, there is one that happens. Within your mind and your heart, something changes when you are creative. And you might say that this is an application. I don't find it an application, it's simply connection, right? So I would say, Yes, because creativity transforms your mind and your heart. Heart as an affective element, mind as a cognitive element. And what is interesting, it does it together. Okay, so in other words, it tells us about existence of certain indivisible unit. I even suspect, this is just, just my conjecture, you see, that uh, those moments of creativity are really moments of wholeness, right? Something that is kept together and doesn't split anymore, doesn't fragment and so on. So I would say answering your question uh, is precisely because creativity defragments our reality. That's what I would say, makes it together, makes it whole, rather than fragmenting into pieces. And that is within our perceptions, not only in the world outside, right? So earlier I talked about Dr. Torrance, the father of creativity. So he passed away in 2003. So uh, when he, uh, at the time, like when he was in uh, college, he, uh, nobody talked about creativity yet. Then, so when, after college, he became a counselor in Georgia Military College. This is a high school, but it's a uh, high school students who are kicked out of uh, their public, no, the schools around their area. So they attended this uh, Georgia Military College. It's not college, it's a high school, right? So those students are uh, troublemakers. So uh, Dr. Torrance helped these students. Uh, and then he found uh, something spark, some spark in these students, a common spark in these uh, troublemakers. And then, so he didn't know what it was. And then later, uh, there was World War II, he 
uh, become because he was a psychologist. He he went to graduate school and he became psychologist and he trained. Uh, he was assigned to train uh, the best uh, the ace uh, pilot in, in World War Two. So in Korea also. So uh, when he was training this the best pilots. Um, what is it? Not just pilots. What is it? Fighters. Fight, fight, fighter pilots. And he also saw this spark, the same spark. It's, uh, and then, and then later he found that that's a, a creative personality, creative thinking, creative attitude. So, like some students have this uh, a tendency. They have this. Uh, um, uh, some kind of uh, creative attitudes are non-conforming or some kind of defiant, rebellious, uh, they have that. And then if they are in the right environment, creative environment, the creative climate, they become the best pilots. And then, but if they are in the wrong environment, the uncreative, uh, anti-creative uh, environment, the anti-creative climate, they become this, uh, they become this uh, uh, troublemakers. So that's how he started uh, uh, focused on studying creativity. So Thanks. like uh, by focusing on this uh, uh, developing creativity, we can save a lot of troublemakers. <laughs> Last question. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I, sorry, I've been waiting for a little bit. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I want to be annoying, but. Um, oh, I got, I got one, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have several questions, so I'd definitely like to talk to you guys afterwards. But uh, so you, when you asked the question about, you know, like, why do we care about creative thinking? I mean, don't, don't you think that, like, so, so when you teach, you get questions like, why do I care about this, right, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, and it's like, well, in some sense, I can't give you an answer because I don't know right. yet, right? Like. I don't know why you're going to need this, but I can show you all these things and I can get you to think like this because maybe in the future you're going to have to tie these things together in a way that's useful. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, I kind of get the impression, I mean, a lot of people probably feel this way right now. I mean, you, you kind of have to identify in today's world what it is that separates you from something that can be automated, right? If this is not a reason oh, to be yeah, creative, yeah. Right, right. I don't know what is. Because, I mean, like, you kind of have to, I feel like we're going to have to make a decision in the future. We're going to have to be able to say, make an argument, you know, why are you useful? Oh, Sounds yeah. kind of messed up, but it's yeah. kind of true. So, Kay. yeah, I used to ask, but you're okay to ask a question like that here. But I used to ask a question like that when I lived in Korea. Oh, no. Think about it. Okay, yeah. so... Um, in, even in <laughs> even in no even in PhD program, my first PhD is from Korea, and then my professors uh, uh, thought I was really disrespectful, and uh, one of them told me I just act like uh, expensive geisha. You know geisha like uh, you don't know geisha. They do. I'm sure they do. <laughs> you know in a bar and then you serve uh, drinks and they drink together, sometimes a prostitute like that. So, but at least he told me it's an expensive place, so <laughs> I was okay. But, so it was always like, whenever I think, why do we learn this, why, why, then just uh, they really killed me. So that's why I ran, ran away from Korea. But you are lucky to be here. <laughs> but I forgot what your question was. So it means, okay, you, don't, you want to be just unique and you don't want to be useful, right? That's what it was. So you, I told you, if you are just you focus on uniqueness, right, and then you want to be different from others, then I told you, you become frustra frustrated dreamer. So you might not be really proud of yourself. That's why I tell my son, I don't know it works for you. Okay, uh, can we? Yeah. Well, thanks very much. It looks like um, the time is up and we need to close this panel. Thanks very much to our two panelists. Thanks very much for your participation.
And without further ado, right, I would like to announce, now we have very important three collaborative discussions. And I would like all of them to happen, right? We have uh, underrepresented women is in FDR. The uh, teaching research is in C391. And smooth pathway between creativity in STEM and STEM industry is in JFK, right here. So please distribute yourself and let's have another hour of intense discussions. Uh, so, well, we came to the, to the, to the finish, mate, uh, finish line, right? Uh, any comments? What do you think? I mean, was it interesting? Was it boring? <laughs> are we tired? Yes, we are. <laughs> of course, we are, right? But it, it was, it was interesting. To me, it was interesting, I, I must say. And the attention was kept myself pretty. OK, what I want to say, I want to say a couple of things, right? And they were sort of mentioned. First, we learned something, I think, we learned, right? Uh, I would like to say a couple of words uh, that were sort of mixed in the beginning, right? First, as I said, you see, it, there, we wrote a grant. We wrote a grant for another conference, uh, right, um, to do this program uh, NSF includes, right? So if this grant goes and if we hold our fingers, right, then we can have a, we will have another conference. It is scheduled more or less uh, beginning of March, right? So it's not in the end uh, of the semester, but rather in the beginning. It could be better. I don't know. My sort of idea of scheduling here, apart from accidental, was that when we finally are by the end of the semester, so we don't work anymore so much. Of course we do, right? So it was not exactly best assumption, but... Okay. Uh, so one thing is interesting here. Two things are interesting. First, what is interesting is that once you get into this program of NSF includes, then suddenly there appear on a other, other uh, chances for us to go after the grant. And in fact, the same program have, uh, have published a, another solicitation in January, new solicitation for something called alliances. The idea that they have in this program is that, as I said, there are like well, actually it's a hundred, but I think they are a hundred because several projects sp split into smaller presentation. But ult ultimately there are 50, 60 projects, all of them in STEM, right? And if, we, if, this, if, if the grant goes through, well, as I said, they will come to us. They, they want to learn. And what is interesting now, since a new solicitation came about creating of those alliances, what does it mean, an alliance, in the language of NSF here? It means to take several of those projects, right, and address certain difficulties in STEM together, right, and solve this difficulty. Those are pretty big projects. They even talk about, you know, at least here, they talk about five million per year for five years. So it's pretty big, right? Um, and we have a chance, I think. But uh, in fact, I was asking, uh, I was asking the NSF program officer, uh, how many projects will you grant? Because they see only three. And I ask, and if we ever go, we go not this year, but next year. There is a deadline in April, April second, maybe, or something like that. Okay. Uh, so this is a possibility. That's one thing. But what is Equally interesting for me personally is this idea of creating a community here at CUNY and outside of CUNY. I'm not limiting, but you know, growing out of here, right? Uh, of, uh, of, of teaching research. In other words, what we, are, what we were talking a lot in those collaborative groups, this was the research done by faculty, by teachers, right? So here you have a perfect example of the possibilities of such teaching research. And what is so good about teaching research is immediately when you do the research, the, uh, it immediately impacts your teaching. So the idea was, it's an old idea, to create a institute at CUNY where each of us, well, each campus would have a, a, a team, 
And we would together across CUNY address certain issues of learning, right? And uh, which, which, which are not only in one campus, but in all campuses. And one example that I can give of, of, of such a possibility is, long time ago we here did a ex teaching experiment on the, uh, on the intersection between mathematics and language, right? We are, uh, you know, we have a lot of um, ESL, right? English as a second, la second uh, language, right? And the idea was following. The idea was whether it's possible by the uh, by the integration of syllabus between algebra and uh, intermediate uh, English as a second language, whether it's possible to help in learning language. Not mathematics, but language. Usually, language and, and mathematics is, is considered where well, language helps learning mathematics. But here, the question was different. Can mathematics help learning language? And in fact, we got very nice results, significant and so on. But this is just one experiment. Imagine if this would be done in every campus that we are having at CUNY, right? Then we would have incredible data. We would have very, you know, variety of populations, right? Because also, say, for example, community colleges, we are, you know, more or less the same, yet we have very different populations. Like BMCC has different population than Hostos, and Hostos has different population than, say, La Guardia, right? Not talking about Gutman already, right? Because, so it would be very interesting, seems to me, right, if we could respond to certain questions, to certain difficulties across the campus, and if it is done by us, teachers, right? So this is the idea. And what is interesting is that this grant actually has a component that might realize this idea. They ask that each such alliance will have a central organization that does the support and so on and so on. It's, uh, it doesn't have to be organizational, it also can be conceptual. So this is, I'm trying to suggest that we could do something, maybe. Uh, well, that's what I wanted to say. Maybe you would like to say something about the conference. Please tell us. Uh, I ask, by the way, everyone for those, for those uh, uh, surveys, you know, surveys of the, please give me back. I mean, when you have, uh, there is a box, yes? There is a box, thank you, there is a box. For those surveys, we collect them. Uh -huh. And the second thing, by the way, to everyone who participated and, and presented, please send us the uh, manuscript, I mean, the, you know, notes from the field, right? And we're going to publish the proceedings from this conference by our, there is a journal, of course, I forgot to mention. We do have a journal called Mathematics Teaching Research Online. Uh, I wanted to put some abstracts that didn't have time, but uh, that's how we're going to do it. Mm. Well, that's, uh, 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 here is, I, I made kind of very, uh, list. If anyone would be interested in collaborating and trying to to think about such an institute or a grant, please write yourself in, and we will and name uh, uh, school and email. Right? That and write it. Uh, no, so I could read. So maybe we can start talking and thinking about that together, if you feel like. Um, what? No, nothing. Uh, okay, so this, as much as on my part, and I want to thank everyone, I mean, after all, many of us stayed here, right, despite the uh, um, you know, situation, right, and uh, thank you very much, really thank you very much, because, uh, well, it seems we learned something, and people are asking, are you making another one next year? So, uh, it's okay. Thank you. <laughs>